As we know, functions can be composed provided that the domains and codomains of these functions match up. Similarly, affine transformations compose, and the composition is affine in an analogous way to how linear combinations are composed, and the resulting composition is also linear. So we have a fact, and this fact is that the composition of two affine transformations, S and T, is also affine. And because it's affine, and we know that each of these transformations can be written in the form of mx plus b for some appropriate matrices and appropriate vectors b, we can ask, what is the resulting matrix for, what, is, what are the resulting matrices and vectors for the composition of two affine transformations? So let's write S of x as mx plus b and t of y as nx plus ny plus c. And let's just be careful about composing these. So if we take the composition, S composed with T, and we apply a vector Y, then this by definition is S applied to T of Y. And we know that T is of this form. So we get NY plus C. And this equals m times the input of this function, which is ny plus c, plus the associated b, oh, this should be a plus, from the transformation s. And if you distribute this all out, we get mn times y plus mc plus b. So the associated matrix that we get is actually just the multiplication of the matrices that we started with. And the associated vector b is some interesting combination of the original vectors b and c, but also with the matrix m. And in particular, if S from same setup Rm, Rn to Rm is invertible, and we wrote our decomposition like this, then we could ask what are the matrices and vectors associated to the inverse of this matrix? And that is exactly So S inverse, let's write of Y, just because we're changing the codomains with do the domains. We get the inverse of M plus, well, rather minus, M inverse of the vector B. And why does this work? Well, if you just take S, for instance, and you apply it to this result, we know what this combination looks like. We get M applied to this term, which gives us just Y back m applied to this term, which gives us negative b, but we have a plus b, and those two cancel. So just like the composition of linear transformations need not commute, similarly, the composition of affine transformations need not commute. So let's look at an example. And a common affine transformation is leave everything alone, just translate by some vector. So let's just keep things very simple. And let's assume that we translate by the vector 1, 0. So we shift everything along the x-axis in R2. So we shift everything along the x-axis. So let's say the vector, let's draw a smiley face here. This smiley face transforms under this transformation. Let's say smiley face is it contained in the unit box. So I'll have to make this a little bit bigger. And it gets translated along the x-axis in the positive direction.
So let's call this transformation T. Another transformation that we can look at, let's call this one S, is rotation by 90 degrees. So when we rotate, the face looks something like this. And then we can ask, what happens when we apply S and T in that order, or if we apply T then S? And what are the matrices and vectors associated to these transformations? So let's actually answer that question first. So T of any vector x equals, well, let's just translate. So it says leave everything in the plane alone. So that's the matrix corresponding to the identity. And shift by the unit vector in the x direction. So I call that E1. So remember E1 equals the vector 1, 0. And S of x is the transformation that rotates by 90 degrees. So I'm going to write that in matrix form because rotation by 90 degrees is 0, negative 1, 1, 0, applied to the vector x. And the b here is 0 because this is, an actually, this is actually a linear transformation. So what happens when we compose these in different orders? So let's just think about this. Imagine you translate first, and then you rotate. This rotation is occurring about the origin. So when we apply T first, and then we apply S again, we're rotating this picture by 90 degrees with respect to this origin. So this face is actually going to be further out than it would have been if we applied the, trans if we applied the rotation initially and then translated. You can already see the big difference between these two pictures. So if we apply first T and S apply to this picture, let's start with our initial configuration. Then what happens after you apply this? Well, first you rotate and then you translate. So this translates everything to something that looks like this. But if instead we applied S after T to the same initial configuration, well, first we would translate, and then we would rotate by 90 degrees. That would look much, much different. So if I were to draw this as a unit grid, that face would now be in this box, rotated by 90 degrees. So it would look something like that. So now let's just check the math out to make sure that this is consistent with these geometric interpretations. So if we apply T after S, to any vector x, what do we get? Well, t says first translate, then rotate. So we end up translating by x, then rotating, because we do matrix multiplication, and the resulting vector b is just e1. So we get rotation applied to x plus e1, which is exactly what we expected from our picture here. If we did it in the other order, well, in that case, first we translate, and then we rotate. And when we rotate, we not only apply the rotation to our initial vector x, but we also apply the rotation to the vector e1. And e1 gets rotated by a 90 degree rotation to the vector e2. So in this case, we get this instead. So, and this is consistent with this picture because if we rotate first, our face ends up somewhere here, like in this picture. And then how do we get from this picture to this one? We translate up by a unit vector, by the unit vector E2.